So hello everybody um, and welcome to this video cast. Um, my name is Matthew Scott and um, I'm the policy lead at the Chartered Institute of Housing for Net Zero and Sustainability. Um, if you're watching this next Tuesday, the 1st of October, um, the day that we'll be publishing this video cast, um, it is the first of two video casts that we're doing as part of Healthy Homes, Healthy Places Week, um, which we are doing as a collaboration between ourselves at CIH and our partners and collaborators at ACO. Um, if you're watching it after that date, um, this is one of several sessions that is now on CIH's website um, to explore the overlaps between health and housing. So please have a look at our website. Please have an exploration of the content um, and see what you find interesting. Um, I'm joined today by two fantastic speakers who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, and the topic of today's video cast um, are the links between health, housing um, and issues broadly related to energy. Um, so especially energy efficiency and retrofit, um, as well as broader issues linked to fuel poverty. Um, and one of the reasons that we're, we're talking about this today and that we want to include this within the week is that over the past couple of years, we've seen quite dramatic spikes um, in international gas prices. Um, which has led to soaring fuel poverty across all areas of the UK um, and also quite substantial increases in the number of people struggling to keep warm um, in their homes. And we know that this has an extremely negative impact on everyone in that position, um, but especially families with very young children, older people, people with pre-existing um, illnesses and disabilities, um, and of course, people on, on low incomes um, as well. So in this context, making homes easier to heat, easier to keep warm through retrofit work, supporting people to increase their incomes through income maximisation and other work, um, as well as not losing sight of the wider role that our communities can play in maintaining good health and wellbeing um, has never been more important. So today's video cast is going to explore some of these overlaps um, and we're going to hear about the work um, of two fantastic organisations um, in doing that. So. Without further ado, um, I'm going to invite our two fantastic speakers to introduce themselves and um, their roles and also to say just a little bit about their organisations, where they work and what they do. So, Ben, I'll come to you first. Do you want to say hello to everyone? Yes, good morning and hello, everyone. My name is Ben Earl. I'm Head of Partnerships and Sustainability at Abbrey. So Abbrey is a housing association based in the south of England. We roughly cover the M4 corridor southwards. Um, we're quite large. We've got about 40,000 homes that we manage. Um, we work with 37 local authorities across our patch. So it's quite a, a, quite a large area. Um, and we're a growing organisation. Um, we've recently merged with Silver Homes um, and there's further ones in the pipeline. So as an organisation, we are um, we provide housing, a, a critical thing for people, affordable housing, um, and that's a really important mission for us all. Great, thanks very much, Ben. And Jen, do you want to do the same? Yeah, um, my name's Jen McPhail. I'm a senior public health officer, um, and I sit within the strategic housing service at Barnsley Council. So my role um, is funded by our public health budget, but we have a distributed model. So I'm lucky to sit within the housing team. Um, so I have a responsibility to tackle housing fuel poverty um, with a focus on trying to reduce inequalities and improve health and well-being. Um, Barnsley um, is a is a small town um, in South Yorkshire. Um, we have just under 250,000 residents um, and over 100,000 dwellings. Um, we have, uh, we're the 38th most uh, deprived um, uh, borough nationally out of 317 and over 20% of our residents live in um, England's most deprived 10% community. So um, it's a great place to, to live in a vibrant community, but we've got legacy challenges, including unemployment, worklessness um, and, and pockets of acute poverty. Great, Jen. Thanks, Ben. So um, let's get right into it, I suppose. I mean, the, the first thing at a broad level that I just wanted to ask you both and, and, and to touch on was just this broad relationship between health, housing um, and the work that we do to alleviate fuel poverty and particularly um, retrofit. So I just wanted to start by asking you both, you know, from the work that you do and from your perspectives, you know, why is it important for health and well-being to, to improve the energy efficiency of our homes and to support residents um, with issues related to fuel poverty? Um, so I'm not sure who wants to go first. Um, do you feel free to <laughs> okay, jump in? Okay, I go first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, go for it. So basically living in a warm, um, comfortable home is actually fundamental to our lives. And so so the link between poor housing um, and cold and damp housing is, is very, very clear. So, so if you're going to solve 
the sort of climate crisis and our sustainability challenges, we also need to take people on a bit of a journey to, to improve their lives. And, and that's why these two agendas neatly combine, because a, a cosy house is a more happy house. And actually, a, a cosy house is, is also probably a cheaper house to, to run. And that, that will end up giving finances back to the household to enable them to live their lives in a, a more fruitful way. And, and I think um, I agree with everything that Ben said there and, and from a public health perspective um, and a local government perspective, you know, we know that the evidence base is there. There's been um, nice guidance that sets out, you know, how to, um, you know, about the, the risk of excess winter deaths and illness and the health risks associated with cold homes. Um, and we know that, as, as Matthew said earlier on, that there are vulnerable groups that are particularly at risk. So people with health conditions such as cardiovascular, respiratory conditions. So there's that... Um, sort of physical impact of living in a cold damp house but also the mental health impact like like Ben said it or cozy homes are warm homes so we know that um living in a cold home and you know yourself if you're living in a kind of cold house it's it's miserable and you don't want people to come over um, and that particularly affects children and young people as well and then the knock-on effect of that um you know the impact of being able to go to school because of those conditions that you might get you know asthma might be exacerbated or going into work um so for us, it's it's about looking at improving the, the the our homes to make sure, particularly vulnerable residents and those that are over sixty five or children uh, and young people, um, and then at a national level, we know that there's an impact. I think, um, uh, you know, the the end fuel poverty coalition estimated that um, last year nearly five thousand excess winter deaths were caused by cold homes, and that's that's at the real kind of extreme end. Um, but even in terms of the 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 cost of the NHS, I think. BRE estimated that it's cost the NHS a billion pounds a year just to treat those people affected by poor housing. So, you know, on a fundamental level, we need that basis for people to, to live in a warm home and stay well, but also thrive. Um, but even the economic case is there as well. Yeah, it's absolutely right. And I think there's there's any number of, of kind of different reports, different public health studies now that have been through this. I know there was a new Marmot report earlier this year as well, which I think it showed that nearly 10 million people across the UK are living in cold, damp, poorly insulated homes and really sort of hammered home those connections, not just between sort of physical health and asthma and some of the things that you've mentioned, Jen, but also the very real sort of mental health impact and also on, on young children, you know, particularly you know, we see stories of children who are, they don't have a space to do their homework that's warm and that's sort of suitable for them to do that. And some of the knock-on impacts that, that can have on educational attainment and um, their relationships with peers at school. You know, once you start kind of getting into it, there's ripple effects all throughout different areas of society from being unable to, to be warm and healthy at home. Um, and you mentioned, Jen, when you were talking there just about improving homes and, and some of the ways that that can help. And I know through some of the work that you've done at Barnsley, um, there's there's some really kind of good evidence and, and examples you've got there. So from, from your own perspective, you know, how have you seen some of the work that you've done across the borough um, sort of contribute to, to sort of reversing some of these situations, if you like, or improving the health and well-being of, of people across the borough? Yeah, I, I think some of this, um, there's this sort of historic uh, side to this, which we've, we've looked at trying to set up um, new specific fuel poverty services within within the local authority. Um, a few years ago, we were looking to get some funding through National Grid, um, and that gave us a kind of opportunity to to test out what, what we could do and what the impact would be. Um, so we had a, a scheme that looked at particularly homeowners and private tenants, because we knew that was a was a gap. Um, uh, and what we did was was go out and give them advice. So in terms of reducing fuel poverty, you know, there's the income maximisation check in, you know, you've got the you're on the um, energy tariff, but also that retrofit and, and energy efficiency side of things. So um, we're lucky in Barnsley that we have um, as well as kind of access to the the national grants sort of as eco um, uh, lad and all the, the, the various different things. We've got our own um, affordable warmth scheme as well that, that provides boilers. So we combined all of that. Um, and we did a bit of work with National Energy Action to evaluate the impact of that. And we sh what we found that we, we, the scheme was kind of predominantly um, uh, targeting older occupiers on extremely low incomes who were living with multiple complex health needs. Um, and when we looked at sort of the, the, the health history interview approach, we found that these um, conditions were, were absolutely exacerbated um, or in, in a few cases um, caused by living in poor quality homes. Um, and if you look at the kind of HHSRS definitions, that's kind of 
at the end of kind of risk to life. So just as one example, um, we did some evaluation and, and asked residents kind of uh, did a pre-intervention questionnaire um, and 44.7 percent of residents responded being um, unable to keep their homes warm when it was cold outside. Um, and then this changed um, post um, intervention to only sort of 24.5%. So we could see there was a measurable impact on that. Um, and, and basically this was through the kind of income maximization and boilers. Um, but but we can definitely, you know, see that, um, you know, the, the warm home support um, helped clients to live in a home that didn't affect their health. We were, you know, you're not looking at reversing some of these conditions like COPD, um, but it certainly meant that they, you know, it showed improvement in my physical, mental health and just that coping with that illness. So that was that's great. And there's been a legacy from that that means that we have our own warm homes team now that's core funded. Um, you know, we still continue to see issues in the in the private rented sector and homeowners, you know, with the cost of living crisis, um, as you talked about, um, and, and particularly in Barnsley, we have a lot of hard to treat properties. So there's a lot of, um, you know, solid wall properties that are more difficult and expensive mm -hmm. to treat. Um, but, you know, that's that's now our priority. And we've now got a, a housing strategy that that, you know, references that living in a good quality, affordable housing that supports our health and wellbeing is something that every resident in Barnsley, you know, should have access to. So that's our kind of mission going forward. And, and one of the things we found, we did a survey of all of our customers last year and energy efficiency was the top concern coming out from all of their concerns, all their worries. So absolutely back that up, really. And I think, I mean, the National Energy Action say that 5.6 million UK households are in fuel poverty. So it's this this direct link. And you can, you must be able to see it with, with mental health and other things that complete link back to it. If you're stressing about where you're, next payment is coming from it must have such a toll on on people's lives yeah absolutely and i think you know what we're trying to do here a lot as well is that kind of early intervention and prevention so what we're trying to do with the with the new services you know we know the levels of um fuel poverty in Barnsley. i think it's 7.7 percent .7 and that's above the the national average of 13.4 i think for for 2022 but we've got real inequalities in the borough so some areas and i know it's model data and it all comes you know um uh from the government but you know according to kind of down to lower super output areas we've got areas of six percent but we've got areas with 37.5 percent so what the team do is is target that and and you know for me it's about looking at that life course approach like you were saying matthew that early intervention you know um the naught to fives but actually pregnant women as well um and one of the answers, obviously, retrofitting houses, once you've done it, you've done it. So whoever's in that house, it's a real long term solution. Sweet. And and also there's the climate change aspect. So, you know, with the extreme temperatures, excess heat and excess cold, but also the kind of, you know, we need to make sure that these these properties, you know, as well as our re reducing our carbon footprint, we, we've um, declared a climate emergency and have an ambition to be net zero by 2035, I think, um, or 2045. Um, so you know it, it all makes sense um in terms of that health and well-being as well as you know the the impact on climate change i'm glad you brought in the overheating point there as well because that's a huge worry particularly from mm. last summer it was the first sort of 40 degree um episode and that led to thousands of deaths in the uk which so we, we we're not just talking about extreme cold here we're also mm. talking about heat as well I think that's it. And and also linked to that is indoor air quality. You know, again, mm -hmm. there's more nice guidance about that. But, you know, with AWAB's law, we're really concerned about the impact to kind of damp on mould on, on the health and well-being and, and the fabric of the building. So we've got to make sure we get we get that right um, in terms of the ventilation. And, and but, yeah, you're right with the excess heat. Um, I think studies have shown that insulation can protect the keep the house cool as well as warm. So um, there's more work to do on that, certainly. Um, particularly talking to residents and making that case, I think. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the last summer, I think the was particularly unprecedented, and there was a there was a report that was done by the Mayor of London's office and um, published a few weeks ago, which was the London Climate Resilience Review, that really talked through kind of all of the different impacts of of that heat wave on kind of London's sort of infrastructure and services. And some of the things that they pointed out is that it was particularly to do with overheating and the impact that had on individual people um, in you know hard to ventilate or kind of hard to insulate homes but they also pointed out sort of different impacts on health services like um, 
you know, IT servers and hospitals really struggling in the heat and operations needing to be cancelled because they couldn't they couldn't get those back online quickly. And um, so those kind of broader those impacts of climate change that we think of sometimes as quite long term, they're already having an impact both on our mm -hmm. residents and people now when we have heat waves, but also on the broader infrastructures that our health services rely on to keep functioning um, day to day. Um, I think you know we, we've covered we've covered sort of a little bit of, of retrofit already, and and Jen, you mentioned a bit about homeowners and homeowners and private tenants has been a really key focus through that work. Ben, I know as a, as a social landlord, housing association property, uh, owning housing association properties, um, social renters, we know, um, you know, through various government statistics that social renters are less likely to have higher incomes and also sometimes more likely to have long term illnesses and, and disabilities. So just just from your point of view as a housing association, um, what are some of the impacts that you see of, of doing retrofit work on, on some of your residents um, and how is it that you, you you're going about that at the moment? Well, I think in the social housing sector, I think there is quite a clear roadmap on this because we are following, I mean, not just our own, um, we've got our net zero targets that we've we've publicly announced as an organisation, but also the government um, is quite rightly pushing for all properties to be PCC by 2030. Yeah. Um, we're on that journey. We've, we reckon we've got about, we have got about 7,000 properties to get it to PCC. We've already got 1,200 currently being retrofitted this year. Um, as part of our social housing decarbonisation fund. We're just about to put another bid in for another 5,000 properties. So we're going to be pretty much there soon. Um, <clears throat> I think actually some of the concerns are where the private housing, you know, where private housing is going because it's not been keeping up with this level of kind of transition. Um, but in terms of what it's doing to our residents' lives, I mean, um, we... It's, it's really interesting to see the difference now that we're actually getting. I mean, ten, the nature of how we're doing this is 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 you will be often doing groups of houses together in a certain area because they're pretty similar. Although you can't just extrapolate and say every home has the same footprint and usage patterns and all the rest of it. But where we have gone in and we've we've sort of started doing the works we some, suddenly find a real awareness locally that actually there's something changing for the better um particularly now with the and and this is a key message that's coming out of government you know the mm. cost of renewables is plummeting and so actually a faster transition to renewables is actually the way of getting us off the 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 dodgy international markets that give us the price spikes that are, are leading to fuel poverty so solar particularly is cut yeah. right through so rather than just taking the the standard fabric first approach which is you start you know doing all the insulation first well clearly when it comes to solid wall properties that's an expensive measure um actually what you find now is that you can make such a difference to the lives much quicker by de fast deployment of, of pv and i would argue long term that battery storage is going to play a C an equal measure part in that because it will help to balance the load of um usage when the sun isn't shining um so we've got 55 million pounds we're investing right through to 2030 in, in retrofitting our homes to make sure we get to that to hit that deadline we're generally finding i mean there's still some properties where you find the residents don't really um, want to get involved but I think I think with all things in life, you know, we we're all on a journey, aren't we? We're in our journey in our personal lives. We're in a journey in our working lives and we're in a journey in our homes about how do we treat the climate crisis. And you'll see over the next few years how more and more people will get used to the fact there'll still always be the old case where if something goes wrong or there's some disruption that's been particularly bad. But I think. I think housing associations are at the forefront, not just of the climate crisis, but also solving it. And and we have to do that by taking our customers with with us. Yeah, I think I think we've tried to do the same as a local authorities make the most of that national funding, um, like for our own stock. So we've got an Almo, um, Burnsley Homes that that manage our um, uh, council housing. Um, but in terms of the retrofit, that the warm homes team kind of oversees all of that, and I think. You know, in the past, they brought in 17.4 million um, to support energy efficiency and retrofit works across Kenya, and that's you know over 2,000 homes. Um, but uh, but one of the other things that you mentioned was you know in terms of the solar panels, I think that's a really important um, 
you know opportunity as well so we've been working with um a not-for-profit energized barnsley for over 10 years and we've been installing um solar pv and the battery storage into social housing um so i think they've done over um 320 properties now so you know that does have a real impact on on fuel poverty um and we've got this ongoing treat you know ongoing program so we'll you know like yourselves looking at shdf funding um we've got a statement of intent out under kind of um eco4 we've got lad schemes so we've done one two and three you know on the kind of ewi and the private sector um, and then there's, you know, all these new and exciting um, things that are coming out of government. I saw on a couple of was it yesterday, the day before, um, talking about the new um, uh, funding stream, this this kind of warm homes local grant. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, as a local authority, how we can dip into that. Um, but I think that one of the big the things we need to tackle is that, you know, we call it the able to pay market. So, those, you know, those properties in the private sector. Um, that maybe need this support but aren't eligible currently and that might be because you know the, the type of property or actually the homeowner homeowners who might be asset rich but income poor so um you know it's going to be interesting in, in in what comes out of the the next few years with the new administration really but we're going to have to tackle private landlords as part of that yes. because they're current currently i mean an f and g rated property has now been forced to improve but mm. I think you need to keep them on that journey, really, because there's not a lot of incentives for private landlords at the moment to actually do this. So the, the people that are living in those homes are then just suffer whatever they're dished out, basically. And and there has to be some minimum standards in this area, I think. Yeah, and I think that'll be interesting if when the renters' rights bill goes through in terms of bringing that decent home standard down to the private rented sector um, to support landlords and tenants, because some of the properties, you know, maybe in Barnsley and other, you know, we're no different from any, a lot of boroughs across the country where there isn't that much asset in the actual private rented property, particularly in areas of deprivation. So absolutely agree. It's going to be about how we get people to that position in time for the, for the 2030 target, really. Yeah, I think particularly when you look at the fuel poverty statistics, I think <clears throat> the private rented sector has always been the tenure with the most fuel poverty. I think the, the stats have consistently been about one in four private rented homes. Um, in fuel uh, poverty compared to you know, much lesser in, in the in the only occupied and particularly the social rent sector, as, as you've said, Ben, um, loads of historic work have been dating back to the Decent Homes Programme and probably before that has worked to really improve social rent of stock up to up to good energy efficiency standards. And I think that that question of of regulation and you know labour saying back we bring back these 2030 targets for the private rent sector, you know, is I think it's, is going to be absolutely critical to to how we get there. And um, I think that. What you're saying, Ben, around the innovation side and the, the solar PV and how do we bring battery storage in? And, you know, we've seen lots of really good examples now of, you know, you take out gas, put in a heat pump, but then you also do the PV and you yeah. maybe do a battery at the same time, because without that, that air source heat pump is potentially challenging to run. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes no more challenging than a gas boiler, but a gas boiler can be very challenging to run on wet central heating system for some people. So that bringing those different bits of technology together is one of the ways that we can really drive down energy bills and we can make those systems work for people um, really well. But the, the other side of it, of course, and as you mentioned already, Jen, is kind of the, the income maximisation side and some of the broader wraparound support I know we can provide to, to residents. And it's almost two sides of the same coin sometimes, and that you're doing the energy efficiency and you're doing the heating system. But at the same time, you're looking at things like, is there any unclaimed income here? Is there any benefits that we can support you with? So I just wondered if you could both maybe talk a little bit about how you support people with that side of the fuel poverty equation and how you support people to access benefits or um, perhaps access employment opportunities um, and how you kind of link those things up with the broader work that you do on, on energy efficiency. Yeah, I mean, in terms of what we're doing in Barnsley, we've got, you know, um, Burnsley Homes have got their own neighbourhood officers and tenants first, so they will support residents that need that, um, you know, additional advice or information about accessing benefits or have the issues. So that's sort of social housing that's there. In terms of um, the, the kind of wider residents, we have a universal advice service across Barnsley that we commission. So we have the um, Citizens Advice, AGK Barnsley, but also Dial, which are a disability charity, so they can do kind of internal referrals. Um, Previously, you know, last winter we did, you know, looked at fuel vouchers and um, welcome spaces, which were kind of like warm spaces and, and used our trusted 
partners um, to really support and find those those people in need. So um, one of the ways that that we do that as well is with our own warm homes team. So obviously they're looking at the energy efficiency side of stuff, um, but they work really closely um, in partnership with our other partners so that they can do that benefit maximisation. Obviously, one of the the campaigns that we're doing as a council at the moment is to try and increase pension credit uptake because that's linked to the winter fuel allowance. So we have a kind of one stop shop on our website as well that which is called more money in your pocket. So it's about all that support that you can get in one place. Um, but we also know that some of our residents are digitally excluded. So we do a number of events, um, for example, down at Bowsley Markets, which is you know really thriving place um, and just talk to people there that maybe are not aware of the support that's available and um, we have kind of healthy homes events so we'll have partners there like the green doctors which is part of groundwork and go and do those those home visits um so it's it's about looking at what we can do to kind of maximize people's income talking to residents directly but also working with our our partners our health partners to make sure they're aware of the links kind of healthy housing and 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 the impact on health conditions. So we tend to do a lot of winter training with frontline workers, you know, making every contact count so that they're aware of the support that's available and how to, to feed into it as well. Um, but we're waiting for the, the next round of um, the housing support grant to be announced by the government. And then we'll look at what we do this winter um, to support residents as well. Um, but I think one of the things that's been really successful is working with our communications team. So last winter we did uh, sort of leaflets to keep warm and well so there was lots of advice again that early intervention prevention about the support services were, were available and we we distributed over 6,000 of those to, to key services um, and we also have an online winter newsletter that goes out every couple of weeks and there's 5,000 subscribers to that um, so so yeah it's about trying to, to get that message across about the supports available and also funding our advice services to, to make sure that they are providing that income maximization and you know, signposting people to things like priority services register, warm, you know, warm homes fund as well. So it's interesting because um, I'm just concluding our ESG report for last year, which we're about to publish, and um, we've obviously brought all our stats together about what we were doing last year for, for helping in this area and looking at, at that customer support. You know, we've been doing benefit reviews for customers. You know obtaining white goods and furniture, um, looking at how we hand out food vouchers and fuel vouchers actually and mm. give for fuel discounts to people. We've also pour some rent for some customers that are really experiencing hardship, which again has helped them in the, their particular time of need. Um, one of the things we've also done over the over the years and, and again last year is we we um, supported 264 people into employment through our, through having a kind of outreach team that worked with our communities so community cafes you know we've got pantries that are working to get food out to the most needy so there there is a real mix of different areas of support that we've brought forward um but i think for me you know i see the climate and energy crisis as being on levels of, of of crisis that that really needs tackling, and I think we we need to really get a handle on helping more customers get off the the vagaries of just being fed what the national grid is feeding them in terms of price costs, because mm. it, you know the grid's going all over the place in terms of stress and and you know particularly gas international gas markets have have sent our fuel bills rising. I think not many of us can understand why they're so much of our electricity costs are pegged to gas prices but anyway that mm -hmm. that is that is one of those things that we're i think will increasingly change particularly as the government starts to shift um the burden of off electricity bills of some of the eco support schemes and put that burden onto the um, onto gas to make you know fossil fuel mm -hmm. heating even more expensive and i think that's an area where i think we could make permanent changes that are going to make such a difference to people's pockets yeah, I think it's a really live area of policy at the moment. It's that that question of all of those legacy policy costs and renewable costs that are currently on the electricity bill largely um, and what we do with those in the long term, because they're certainly a distortion in terms of they make electricity more inflated price wise when it's already you know three, four times the, the price of, of gas, at least to the end user, the end customer who's accessing that through the grid and I think you're absolutely right Ben that the next sort of four or five years particularly when we've seen 
what this government has announced already around its clean power ambitions, all the things it's done on onshore wind already, bringing that back into um, into the NSIP regime, which is what they proposed through the new the new MPPF consultation, and all, all of these things are, mm. are are going to get going very very quickly. Um, and it's it's sort of fascinating to hear you talk, Jen, as well about um, some of the work that you've done with partners, particularly you know and and Odile, um, and of course Age UK and the, the citizens' advisors of the world that we know do all of this kind of incredible work supporting people in, in myriad ways. And I just wanted to touch a little bit on on this in a bit more detail. So particularly this this kind of this role of partnership and collaboration in the work that you do. You know, we always say, and, and it's true, you know, we always say you know, working in partnership, working towards shared goals, it gets us where we want to go faster and in a better way. And um, but could could you both reflect a little bit just on what is the value of those partnerships that you've got with other organisations, whether it's charities or consumer groups, whether it's any relationships that you've got with your supply chains for retrofit and how they support you? You know, how does that really enable you to do the work that you do around sort of energy efficiency and retrofit, but also on the supporting people more generally and side of things as well? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a couple of things that we're doing in Barnsley. I think one of the, the, the kind of key things is the housing strategy again, that's kind of pulling everything together now and, and driving that forward. Um, and we've, we've over the past few years uh, made some really good kind of links with health as well. So we've made sure that our housing strategy has that kind of health thread all the way through it. Um, and, and one of the other things that we've we've launched kind of relatively recently is our, we've got an affordable warmth charter. So we looked at how to address fuel poverty with partners across the borough because it, the, the, there isn't going to be one organisation or one place that can solve this. It's going to have to be a kind of combined effort that needs to be embedded in, you know, we, we call it kind of health in all policies. So um, we have a, a charter that um, aims to to kind of pull organisations and that's businesses as well as charities. And um, we've got kind of local organisations such as CAB and Dial, but also regional. So our, our SWIFT, which are our health partners across um, South and West Yorkshire, and then nationally, so actually NEA are members now. Um, and basically the charter brings partners across the borough to sort of share knowledge, skills and resources to tackle health differences caused by fuel poverty. Um, and what, what all of these organisations will do is, is make pledges to address fuel poverty over the winter um, against um, the, the kind of five key aims around sort of uh, energy efficiency, fuel poverty, but also reducing carbon emissions as well. Um, and we have uh, a kind of couple of meetings a year, so that gives up the opportunity for these organisations to come together and do some joint partnership working, but also look for gaps so we can look for um, opportunities to apply for funding. Um, and we've recently just done the sort of first year uh, review. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of what the work that some of the partners have done locally, so Age UK, Barnsley secured over £100,000 of benefit gains just for 140 clients. Um, our warm homes team gave 114 grants um, and then obviously citizens advice given out, you know, they've addressed um, over nine, 900 issues in terms of sort of charitable support and food banks. So, you know, it's a really important group, you know, group for us to try and tackle those um, sort of fuel poverty and those health inequalities sort of a system level both taking the kind of national information from NEA and guidance and obviously the training that they provide as well, but also are, you know, down at a local level. Um, so that that's one of the things that we're we're really proud of. But also we have a, a damp and mould task and finish group obviously responding to, to AWAB's law. We've pulled that together with um, Burnsley Homes who, who chair that, but also private sector housing. We've got tenants on there as well. It's important, you know, through all of this, We've maybe not talked about that enough, but to make sure we've got that voice from communities, because actually, you know, like Ben was saying, if we're going to make this happen at a level, we've got to, you know, get people on board on that journey. Um, but also health partners are part of that now. So it's about how we tackle that damp and mould kind of across tenure, uh, again, targeting those with health conditions made worse by the cold. I suppose the the biggest um, collaboration we have is we're part of the Greener Futures Partnership, which is a, a coalition of five housing associations. So Ambrianca, Hanover, Home Group, Hyde and Sanctuary are working together um, across most of the country, looking at how we can collaborate to um, share um, issues and, and, and cut costs on, on things. And for a good example is we, we launched a new retrofit framework 
which is worth 1.5 billion and it's brought in a kind of consortium of approved contractors uh, of about 100 contractors and consultants which have signed up to deliver retrofit works um in different aspects and different places but but under the sort of auspices of, of the partnership so what we're trying to do is is collaborate effectively and, and trying to share some of the costs and the risks to actually make it happen quicker, but also cheaper. And I think that's something that's been really, really helpful to us. And if you look at, I mean, if you look at our all of our carbon footprints as well as organisations, then uh, the majority of our carbon footprints are in areas where we're not in sole control of of the asset or or the or the, the relationships. And I think that's where I see. The next few years being really interesting because we are going to have to work even closer together on these things and dropping some of the you know total control an organization has because you're going to have to blend some of those boundaries more and I, and I think it's a really interesting area to examine as to how this takes place but it's it's certainly something that you know we see partnership as fundamental it's why it's in my job title because i can't solve these problems by myself uh, for the organization and our organization can't solve it either on its own you know we need to, to to work as a sector to do it because you know we're all trying to solve similar things but if we're all sort of in our own silos doing it it's a more expensive and more bureaucratic way of doing it yeah I would, I would completely agree and we've got something sort of similar in, in Barnsley called Positive Climate Partnership which aims to bring those organisations together to address the the ambitions of so as a council we we aim to be zero carbon by 2040 but as a borough we've got that for 2045 and we've got the same approach that actually you need you know we need to coordinate and champion local action to tackle the climate crisis and that that feeds directly into our um, affordable warmth charter so we've tried to link the two together because you know it like you're saying climate change is an inequality and those people that are in fuel poverty are going to suffer more we know that than can so we've tried to get the kind of um we've got the people like the salvation army involved in that but also every who are based in, in barnsley so trying to get that you know uh showing that the impact can be done at a real local level but also um we need the the you know our, our key partners um involved in that as well and of course ben you mentioned um sorry jen you mentioned that the importance of residents as also as partners in this as well and the need to to be really thinking about resident engagement and how we bring residents on that journey towards sort of more energy efficient homes homes that aren't heated by gas boilers or maybe other forms of heating that they've had in the past and <clears throat> i want to ask Ben specifically, actually, I know this is something that Avery's done a lot of work on. So I just wonder, could you say a bit about sort of the ways that you involve residents in your retrofit programmes and how you bring them in um, into what you want to do and, and kind of bring that alive for them? Yeah, I mean, you do need to take a particular group of residents on a journey around what's going to happen because, you know, there is elements of disruption to this. Let's not be open and honest about that. So there's generally about six processes that or six parts of the process that we kind of look at there's a general awareness so there'll be a an introduction to what the project's about and 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 sort of sort of getting them warmed up to why we're doing something and the, and what the benefits will be long term we then tend to have a kind of launch around something make a bit of razzmatazz locally mm -hmm. very much personal support you know having our staff very present in a community to make sure that that any questions are answered um then it comes sort of comes down to the individual design for each of the properties with the families that are living there what does it mean for them in terms of the specifics so you know what what measures are happening what's going to that involve um where what's what should you expect that kind of thing then there's the kind of installation process you know actually keeping very very live about what's actually happening there and then each day and when things are expected and you know oh was there a plant pot damage well we need mm -hmm. to sort that out sort of thing you know it's very much hands-on um then of course there's the official handover of the new the new systems so you know for things like heat pumps you probably do mm -hmm. need to work with the resident to kind of explain how they work and how you generally don't need to mess with them really you can leave them alone and they'll just they'll work um you know pv okay it, you could argue it's a bit of a fit and forget but actually often they'll be linked to a smart meter and the smart meter will be having different might have a green light one moment and an orange light another moment and you need to explain all these things to yeah. to the customer 
And then, of course, there's the sort of final post work stage, which is just assessing, making sure lessons are learned so that when you move to the next group of residents, you've you've improved your systems. Now, all of that means at time to time there will be issues and, and it's about making sure you're on them because clearly you are the face of the organisation at that point and, and that customer hasn't necessarily asked for you to come into their property and do things particularly with contractors who they don't know but it's it's a journey and and i think if most people if you're if you're very clear about why and what and then how most people will generally fall into line and say yeah okay i can see that this is going to be beneficial to me in the long run yeah it's great and i think you know We've seen loads of examples, particularly with heat, with heat pumps, of that kind of real hand holding approach, particularly afterwards. You know, you go back several times, is everything still working OK? Have you got any questions? Okay. And you go back before winter and you say, OK, we'll just do a check, make sure that before you need to really start relying on this thing, that you're happy with it and that it's working well. And you know, we've seen that through various kind of research and evaluation projects, that when that's done really well, you know, people love them. People really okay. like the level of warmth they deliver, that kind of healthier heat people sometimes refer to. And um, so it's it's really, really critical that we that we do it well. And I think as a sector, we've got a lot of um sort of collaboration and sharing to do as we start to put heat pumps in more and more homes about you know how we do that, what's our different approaches and you know, as you say, Ben, what are some of those things that will go wrong and you know, can we preempt them next time, both in our own organizations okay. but but yeah. elsewhere as well. Picking up on your earlier point, though, just also yeah. this ecosystem approach, you know, there isn't a one size fits all to all properties here and you have to work the measures together. And, and I think if you are fitting a heat pump, you do need to be aware the electricity bill could go up. So then hence the PV is there to compensate. So it's that working in, in unison to make sure you give the blend it's going to be right for that household. Yeah, great stuff. OK, we, we are swiftly moving towards time, so I want to ask one more um, sort of question and then we'll we'll move towards wrapping up. And I think the the, the final question, uh, sort of substantial question I want to ask is this this week that we're doing with ACO is healthy homes, healthy places. And I just wondered if you could both reflect on the importance of, of community in place to to the health of our residents and the health of our um, of, of our res of our households and um, particularly thing anything around sort of work we might have done on biodiversity or things like green spaces or blue spaces. I was reading a, a report last week, I think that the Environment Agency did on, on kind of blue spaces, ponds, canals and the benefits that they can have to, to health and wellbeing. And um, so I just wondered if you had any any reflections or any work that you've done um, around maybe green and blue spaces or, or biodiversity and, and how that can impact health and wellbeing in our communities. I mean, at Abri's um climate strategy when we brought it out we was we we sort of announced that we were going to do um a piece of work around biodiversity and i'm pleased to say that that sort of moved on now to like a biodiversity action plan and it's kind of got three parts to it new the new build sector and how we integrate biodiversity from the start to help place making but also what do we do with our existing estates um and and the the most critical i think which is involvement of people actually having a say and, and also an impact on how they they create those communities so we've we just launched a project in in southampton for one of our traditional estates which is coming up to its 100 year anniversary and we're working with the whole estate to actually come forward there's lots of green space on this estate but it ten, tends to be large areas of grass where lots of people well sometimes pull a vehicle on to to park up rather than actually see it as a kind of a, a real amenity space so we're working with that community and we're going to be planting trees we're going to be planting wildflower meadows we're going to be putting in some hopefully impactful living sculptures so willow sculptures that hopefully will provide impact for that community working with the local primary school because we think that access to green space is not I mean, clearly it doesn't negate if your house is cold, damp and you've got loads of other problems like we talked about earlier, then just having green spaces and a few trees outside isn't going to solve mm. that problem. But actually, we all want to uh, live in, in healthier spaces and, and, and nicer places to live. And so biodiversity is really, really important. And we know that the nature crisis in combination with the climate crisis is going to lead to degradation in mental health as well as physical health so so for us it's it's an integral thing um 
and we're looking at obviously with the new arrivals of new things on sites like um, SUD schemes, sustainable <laughs> urban drainage schemes, which are transforming how estates look because you're providing an area for, for water ponding, but you're also providing a greener space as well for access. Um, you've got the new um, requirements for biodiversity net gain and how that works for new developments. So there's a whole series of things here that are coming together. But again, it gives us another strategic opportunity to look at this more holistically. And I, I think that's where we're we're heading as a housing association. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we recognise the impact that the kind of environment you live in, you know, has on your health and well-being. And one of the, the things that we've got now is a a health impact assessment that, that we ask um, for planning permission where it's sort of large scale development um, or sort of spatial planning and that that asks developers um, to look at the impact of their you know um, the the housing um, development or whatever it is on the, on the local community in the local area so um, really it's looking at the kind of wider impact so obviously with housing you know you're looking at the kind of security of the housing um, accessibility I mean we've not you know housing is such a huge thing anyway uh, you know and particularly um, when you're working with partners there's a lot of jargon in it but you know around the kind of quality sustainability of that property um, but also looking at the wider impact so the economy and employment and the links to health and um, you know transport all of the all of these um important things particularly for people that um that may have lower incomes so for example access to public services and um, thinking about how developments will link into kind of open space and nature like ben was saying you know the design quality and having those safe accessible green spaces um particularly for underrepresented groups uh, you know so people with disabilities and that that sort of stuff so what we ask people to do is, is fill that in and look at the impact, but both the sort of negative, but also the positive impacts as well. And I think developers going through this process and there's a sort of guide to doing it can actually look at the benefits that it can bring, but also then how they minimise the impact. So, you know, things like air quality and noise, making sure that, you know, development phase is, is um, you know, the impacts are mitigated. Um, but also healthy food is an important part of the environment we're in. Um, you know, in terms of the commercial determinants of health, I mean, you can go on and on and on. So, yeah, I think I think it's an area that um, is really important. And obviously, with the the government looking at large scale new developments, it will be really important to make sure that they're they're really good quality and do improve that health and well being, and help people to thrive. Really. Yeah, and I think from a, from a policy point of view, I mean, the the MPPF consultation that I've already mentioned, which I think closed um, maybe yesterday or even today. You know, lots of information in there about different plans to improve access to green space, you know, things about renewable energy generation. So, you know, this is clearly the direction that, that things are going and we're absolutely right. I think to, to try and be ahead of it and to try and be asking developers and you know people interested in that space to, to do those kinds of assessments, Jen, um, right. and to really make sure that we're building, you know, when we're building a housing estate, we're not just building an estate, you know, we're trying to build a community, we're place, place shaping, place making, we often call this, um, which is, you know, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, we, we've kind of getting towards time now, so I just wanted to end with with one sort of final quick question for you both, which is just reflecting on everything that we've been talking about and the, these kind of broader connections between your know, health, well-being, housing and um, energy, fuel, poverty um, and all of the work that I know that you've both done in your organisations and previous, you know, if somebody watching this video cast is, well, what, what's the kind of key learning? What's the one thing I want to take away? What would you say that the main thing that you've learned across the years doing this work is and what would you want to share with people um, before we end the, the video cast? I think I think for me, um, trying to, and, and you know, Ben said the same, it's about partnership working um, and that takes time and you've got to build those relationships and make that case. And as I said before, you know, housing generally is complex, the roots into it, and we use a lot of jargon. So it's about um, trying to make the case and linking it for health and housing and social care. Um, using the language that, that our partners would use, but also looking at how we can help them meet their outcomes. So, for example, we've got lots of um, residents with COPD in Barnsley. So if we can use the kind of policies and the, and the services on offer to address that, then you're more likely to kind of get people working together. Um, but also the other key thing is, you know, we mentioned as well, it's thinking about the resident journey, the input, the outputs for them, what you know what this means and designing services and um, support mechanisms that work for them because there are a lot of barriers that people 
you know, come across, whether it being health or financial. Um, and some of those residents will need handholding. Um, so it's about offering kind of proportionate universalism. So you've got a, a service that people can access, but for those that need more support, you've got that there. Um, and that's helped with looking at kind of the data as well and the evidence base. So whether that's looking at the kind of health data or fuel poverty data. Um, and then lastly, it always helps to evaluate that impact, I think, to show um, what you're doing, whether that's kind of senior managers when you're looking for more money or partners to look at kind of co-producing pieces of work or, or residents as well to show the benefits um, of, of the kind of retrofit and the fuel poverty work that you're doing. Yeah, I'd certainly agree that trying to come up with the evidence of, of where you successfully delivered things and what difference it's made to people's lives. I think I'd issue more of a personal challenge, really, which is get alongside your own property and start working out what is it you need to do, because I think that will help you in your understanding of what will then happen to customers when they come up against barriers and how we overcome them. I mean, I've recently put PV and battery storage and a heat pump in my Victorian terrace and really upgraded its energy efficiency. And that's taught me a lot. And just dealing with the supply chain and, and stuff has taught me a lot about how skilled labour and um, how we get the kind of workforce in, in place to actually make this happen at scale is needed. And I think that has helped me enormously in now my understanding on the things that I need to be talking to residents about and how we tweak the messages we're giving because it's you know it's very very easy in this world to sort of feel like you're being done to and I think we've got mm. to really crack the you know this is an opportunity to once and for all bring your cost of living down but actually make your life more improved uh, and it shouldn't whereas actually if you just leave it and it's a it's a kind of thing that you've got to do then you you're kind of reluctant to do it and and that's always it's always more of a negative and i think it's a real shift in perception we have to drive as a society to think you know no the reason we're having to meet carbon targets is because a, a climate change world of three degrees and upwards is a world i don't want my ch children mm -hmm. to live in and to do it is going to in, impact our lives now because we've got to do something about it. But let's try and make it as as beneficial to us all as possible um, and to go on that journey. And whether you're in senior management or, or, or at the top of an organisation, you should be going on that journey with those at the lower rungs that are having to make choices every day that, you know, some of us find well, we, we sort of scratch our heads and think, I can't imagine being in that situation. Uh, thank you, that's a wonderful sentiment to end on. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to end by just thanking you both so much for your insights and, and for doing this. Ben from, from Happy Group and, and Jen from Barnsley um, Council. It's been a really wonderful conversation and I think, you know, I hope for everybody listening, I hope you really found it insightful um, as well. So just to wrap up for those of you watching this um on tuesday healthy homes and healthy places week and um, it's going to continue for the rest of the week and um, we've got another conversation tomorrow about the power of partnerships and um, that will be uploaded um, and then we've got a webinar on thursday about addressing health inequalities through supported housing and um, which you can still sign up to on cih's website and um, for those of you watching this afterwards and um, after healthy homes healthy places week and um, all of the content from the week um, is online please feel free to explore it um, and i hope you can um, you can learn bits and pieces for your own work and for your own practice and um, from what we're doing and um, so thank you um i'll just say ben jen thank you so much again that's been fantastic um and i hope you all listeners and of course both of you um, have a lovely rest of the week and weekend thank you thank you thanks